I'm Julie Kelleher. I'm the Artistic Director of The Everyman in Cork City. Thank you very much for meeting with me today. My pleasure. Can you please tell me about your background? How did you get involved in theatre? Sure. Um, so, I guess as a child, um, I attended drama classes outside of school um, from the age of maybe, God, I don't know, maybe like 10 or 11. And then right through my teens um, when I moved on to secondary school. Um, and when I was thinking about what I was going to do for my, you know, my third level of studies, uh, UCC just uh, had just opened up a new course in drama and theatre studies, a new uh, Bachelor of Arts in drama. So it had been my intention to study English and do a, a BA in English, um, but somebody drew my attention to this particular course and I thought that that would be um, even better suited to me. I suppose one of the things that I learned even as a young person was that I found um, going to my classes with my, my friends who I'd met there that I found acting or performing or the, all of the things to, to do with making theatre that I found it really occupying um, and I have a very busy mind so it's good for me to feel occupied and not distracted and focused um, so I thought that that would be an excellent way to spend three years of study on something that kept me so occupied and so so focused rather than something that I might be bored doing so I uh, I did that I studied um, joint honours half English half drama for those three years from 2001 to 2004 and so I've continued to work then professionally since since graduating there when I did a master's there as well so I did a master I just had a break and then I went back and did a master's in drama um, in 2005 2006 so yeah I've been working since then there are many different theatre occupations. How did you choose what to specialise in? Well, it's really difficult. I remember they, when they asked us, um, the process of applying for the, the bachelor's degree was, you know, you had to get your marks and exams and things, but there was also an interview and an audition process. Um, and they asked what, you know, had a, whether I had a sense of what I wanted to do, and I didn't at that stage, and they said, did I want to be an actor? And I said, oh, no. Absolutely not. No, I couldn't possibly. Um, but that actually was what I went on to do out after college a little bit. I think you know I had enjoyed that so much, and I, I guess a couple of people said, "Oh, you you're maybe good at that." So I thought, okay, I'll you know I'll give that a go. Um, and I you know it, as part of the course there was an internship between second and third year where you had to do some practical work, and I wound up working as a performer with Kirkadurka actually. Um, which was a really thrilling thing and it was it was on a, um, a devised piece of work so we made the work up as we went along which was a, kind of an extraordinary experience really um, and a very formative experience for me um, and then the following year Pat offered me a job as an actor in his production the following summer it was my first paid my first paid job in the theatre was an, as an actor so I, you know I thought that was really um, yeah, it was completely thrilling for me, and so I sort of figured I'd do that for a while. But it's not easy. Cork is a small town, so you know that's not that easy here. So I spent the year between my B and my masters working, um, kind of on a voluntary basis on some projects. You know, Cork was hosting the European Capital of Culture celebrations that year, so there was there was kind of piecemeal, like little bits and pieces of work to to pick up. Um, some paid, some unpaid, so I sort of did as much as I could um, and I wound up that year working on a show here at the Everyman which was an opera based on a, 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 a kind of an 18th century French novel um, and the director, they were, I auditioned for an acting part and I didn't get the part but I had already quit my part-time like retail job so when I they were advertising for an assistant to the director, not an assistant director, but an assistant to the director, so maybe more like a PA. So I figured I'll just, you know, and it wasn't paid or anything, so I was like, oh, you know, whatever, I'll just do that and then I'll be in the room and I'll get to see the theatre being made or whatever, so fine. Um, there was a brilliant producer working on that show. Um, and so in the end, I wound up on that show, like the only thing they had budget to pay me for was uh, to do the laundry. So I did the laundry on the show. I also sung in the choir. I danced the tango at the opening of Act Two with a, another dancer, and um, 
and was the assistant to, to the director. So um, that was also a very formative experience in that it showed, you know, I got to see lots of different things and, you know, I, I suppose I spent the next number of years kind of straddling the kind of performance on one hand and production on the other. So after I finished my master's, I decided to move to Dublin, notionally with an idea that I would, you know, pursue uh, the life of an actor but um, you know I was very I'm always very keen to, you know I'd say a busy mind like keen to keep working and keep busy all the time so um, it transpired that the producer I had worked with on the, on the show I was just talking about was based in Dublin and needed an assistant producer to work with her through that the course of that year because she had so many projects um, and just needed an extra pair of hands so I guess she had seen a year and a half previous that I was capable of doing lots of different things all at once um, and so she took me on and effectively that you know I was paid throughout but it was really kind of a, an apprenticeship arrangement because she taught me sort of everything that she knows and you know introduced me to loads of people in Dublin and um, I, I suppose gave me a real taste of what it meant to you know to produce work and to work very closely with artists um, in a very um, kind of unique and special way you know that it, that it was much more about li than just line producing though that was part of what we did um, you know I suppose I got to see those ground level talks between artists and producer when you know the artist is at kind of concept stage and how the producer works with them through kind of funding processes right through to um, pre-production and delivery and so that was a very thrilling thing and you know and I got to work on sort of more commercial projects as well so so I was like, okay, well, actually, maybe, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe I'll just be a producer. Um, and I came back to Cork and worked, you know, at the end of that year, I came back to Cork and worked kind of in a, a range of roles, really, but all kind of in that general territory. So a festival manager, kind of company manager for a, a, a company that's now closed. Um, I did some PR and marketing work at Karkadarka, so like all the different skills I had ha learned as a producer, I was sort of, you know, using them in various areas. Um, and I did briefly go back to a little bit of performing between kind of 2011 and 2013. And I also did, directed my first show at that time as well, um, whilst also working in the marketing department here. So I guess like the theme is that, you know, I was doing lots of things all of the time and also like paying my way by um, working as a singer at weekends. So uh, to go back to your original question, which is how I chose what to do, I didn't I, like make a, a very definite choice at all. I spent, I guess, 10 years dabbling in all sorts of things to try and figure out what um, I was good at um, and where there was a need for my skills, I guess, which is a, a separate thing to what you're you know, good, good at. Um, and when my predecessor announced that he was moving on from this role in 2013, he called me and said that I should consider applying for this role um, because he had worked with me a little bit as an actor and in my capacity as kind of a, um, acting marketing manager here as well. So he knew I had a, a sense of, I guess, the kind of programming uh, landscape and all of that kind of thing. Um, so I, I applied for the job, even though I thought in the beginning that I wouldn't and that I'd be too young and, you know, la la. Um, but anyway, I applied for the job and so I've been here five years now. So I guess it's, it's uh, I realise the longer I'm here, the, how, um, even though it was completely unique and muddled, that the 10 years of work that, I, that I've done before arriving at this spot was, com was, was a perfect kind of introduction to, you know, what's required in this role. Um, because I've seen, you know, production from the artistic and from the administrative side or the producing side, so it gives me a really good um, 360 degree sense of that, I guess. Um, as well as having met a lot of people both in Cork and Dublin on the road, like to here, so um, yeah, I guess it means I have a good kind of scope of knowledge of, you know, who's making what and who's doing what in the Irish scene, at least. Um, so yeah, so maybe it chose me is the, is the answer. And what exactly do you do as an artistic director of Everyman? Um, so roughly speaking, it kind of splits into, well, two, maybe three parts. 
Um, the, the biggest part is um, the programming, so choosing choosing what work happens on the stage here, whether that's work that we generate in-house ourselves or work that we receive as a, as a, a receiving house that's maybe touring. So that takes up the most of my time and so like generally speaking that's just a lot of uh, replying to lots of queries or seeking out work, going to see lots of other shows and lots of other artists so I have a good sense of uh, what's happening and what might be suitable for our programme. And then I suppose the other two elements are kind of driving the kind of overall strategic you know position of of the venue and that feeds into maybe more like our fundraising and our you know our position in the city and those kind of maybe slightly bigger picture things which you know that's not stuff I'm doing every day but it's stuff I do have to think about um, and that I like thinking about very much actually and then the third element of the role is um, well goes between some, sometimes I direct shows for the for the theatre so um, for the last four years I've directed a show every summer um, usually it's reasonably kind of classic or repertoire title you know that we run for a good long stretch in the summer um, so that or when I'm not doing that you know overseeing the in our in-house program and, and producing along with our line producer Naomi um, yeah, making sure that uh, the artists who are working on that are supported and that the shows uh, get delivered on time and on budget and uh, to as many people as possible. Is it what you expected when you applied for this job? Just gonna have a little drink. Sure. I guess because I worked here before, I, I, ha I had a good sense of what to expect. Um, I think it took me two years to get up to speed with the, like the volume of inquiries that come at you, you know, from people who want to rent the theatre, who want you to come and see their show, or you know, who want to meet with you, or you know, and, and many of those things I also want to you know attend and do and see. Um, but time management is a real challenge because there's you know. Um, there's enough work for probably two humans working more than 40 hours a week really so you have to pick and choose and so that's the, one of the hardest things I guess about the job is having to say no or to disappoint people say no I can't come and see your show or no I can't program you or no I can't cast you in the thing that we have coming up um, because there there is limits to all of the things that we can do in terms of time and money I guess um, so I guess maybe that element of the job was a little bit more invisible to me than some of the other things like so working in the building I knew what to expect in terms of my colleagues and working in the building and that kind of thing um, and I think after you know after two certainly after three years I felt much more in my stride and able to sort of um, agonize a little bit less about you know things that we couldn't do or people we couldn't work with because uh, it's not helpful to them or to me for me to be sort of wringing my hands, you know, as long as I can give a kind of an honest and straightforward response as to, you know, why something won't work out, then I think, like, I just then move on because there's lots of other work to do. I think I, in the beginning I spent a lot of time going, oh no, this is terrible, oh, why can't this happen, you know? Um, which, as I say, is helpful to nobody and, you know, only eats up my time. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a little bit better at that. But it's, I, it's important to remain open, I think, you know, so you don't want to close down those responses to, you know, or those instincts um, either, because uh, that's the excitement is that, you know, that something really interesting might come your way. So you have to remain open to that possibility, I guess. What skills are required to do this job well? Um, people skills I think is top of the list so you have to be really interested in people you think you have to find people really fascinating and curious and and particularly artists um, and uh, to be able to understand what sort of makes people tick or what motivates people um, so that you can really help them get to where they want to go I think that's a, um, a huge part of it you uh, and, and, and I guess in terms of sort of bringing a team along or kind of uniting people around a vision, I think that's a really, um, you know, your people skills, those kinds of soft skills, you know, and communicating and um, are very important. I think, think being organised is very important. As I say, there's such a volume of work and, uh, you know, like that, uh, you know, the first two years, I think I'm getting better and better at, at 
at finding sort of tools that help me be better organized that you know so I don't necessarily have to write everything that I need to do down all the time and um, though that is a system I operate um, and I think this is one of the things I'm learning but like because this is the second senior most role in the organization you have to learn how to delegate or be you know you have to understand what's um, what needs to be a priority for you and what you can delegate to some of your colleagues um, and then I guess like the other thing that I think I bring to the role that you know might not necessarily be for everybody but what I think is of value uh, is to have a very open mind where art and entertainment is concerned so I have very particular tastes as do most people but um, I don't think that my taste is my, my taste is only important um, where where it's applied in the program and it's never applied across the entire program I and mean, there has to be kind of a base level of quality but I'm not going to attend every single show in the program and that's important because then we need other people you know to be able to to um to see what might be a value of to other people in terms of art and entertainment I think is um, rather than say I think this is good therefore other people should think it's good um or valuable I think that's a very important um that sort of sense of objectivity, I guess, around it is, is an important skill too. What are the most challenging aspects of being an artistic director? Definitely that sense of of, um, of not being able to support as many people as we'd like. Uh, although that's probably not necessarily a challenge of the role so much as a challenge of the particular limitations that we have around budget and space. Um, you know, there are more brilliant things, shows, people than we have time to accommodate or employ. So that's like that's one of the hard things, you know, that you have to sort of um, rein yourself in a little bit um, and make some really tough decisions about, um, yeah, who to help, who to support, you know, in the context of like there being many, many more people than you can really or realistically or feasibly help and support. Um, and then I guess on a personal level, like the, like all of the things that I do, sort of can be boiled down to the to this idea that like I just have to make decisions all the time. Like I spend my day like weighing things up and making, you know, making a call on it, um, which is fine. But it's it's a challenge because of the volume of those, you know. So like, it's like if my judgment was a muscle, I'm like working it out like all the time, all the time, all the time. Um, and so there are days <coughs> when. Um, I could get home and my husband would say, well, what, what do you want to eat? And I'd go, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> that muscle is really tired, like I can't, I've run out, you know, of, of, that, of that energy for today. You know, I've been using my, been exercising that all day long. So, um, yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's a challenge. <laughs> it sounds a bit bonkers maybe, but, um, but that's, that's a real feeling I have. The, it, yeah, it's about being overwhelmed with information, which of course is getting worse for us all in our daily lives anyway. And what do you do as a theatre director? So then as a, when I'm directing shows, so typically it would be my decision to choose what the title of the show is um, or to put it to my boss and say this is what I think we should do and these are the reasons why, um, whether I direct it or not. Um, and like for example the show that we're directing this summer I'm not, or that we're producing this summer I'm not directing it even though I love it but we've got a brilliant director on board to do that so um, but when I am directing, I guess it's to me to, in the first instance, kind of bring together the the creative team or to work with our producer to do that and to um, to make decisions about casting so that we've got sort of the people that we think are best positioned, you know, to deliver the vision of the show that I might have. And so um, typically I'd spend, you know, pockets of time in the in the we'll say three to four months up up to the show sort of reading and rereading the script and making notes and um, I like to go through it with a very fine comb so um, Katie Mitchell talks a lot about sort of a f like forensic uh, looking at the text so to you know to sort of understand every moment in it and be um, and the context of every moment and you know so 
and whether that's like really small musical references or a reference to a piece of clothing or something you know so I sort of compile as much of that as I can so that's quite a dramaturgical function I guess but that really you know that helps me is like you know to sort of gather as much information as possible um you know in order to be able to once we get into the rehearsal room um have those conversations with actors who might be exploring that in terms of their own character and also it helps so while that's ongoing uh, another thing that really helps that is to um uh have conversations with the design team on it you know who who bring a different perspective to what the text is doing or saying um, and helps us kind of construct I guess a vision for the for the production or you know why we're um, doing this play now so for example last year we made Martin McDonough's The Lonesome West and it was a play that I studied for my masters and wrote about for my masters but that I found really funny like 15 years ago and I thought you know with my producer artistic director hat on you know uh, people really seem to like this playwright and they buy lots of tickets so like you know and you know we have to kind of we have a specific budget that we need to work to so a play that has a cast of four it like you know makes sense for us this summer um, but I hadn't reread it and so when I when I did reread it um, I was a little bit worried because the, the piece of work that we were doing directly before it was um, a show called Asking For It which is about um, the story is about a girl who is gang, a teenage girl who's gang raped at a party, and the the aftermath of that experience for her, um, and it, so I suppose it's really about how, kind of to how toxic masculinity can get out of control, you know, and really be damaging um, to every body it touches, and the Lonesome West is a is a much sort of lighter on one level, but uh, you know, it, in that it's very funny, like it's a comedy. Um, but it's kind of a you know about two brothers you know who do sort of live in a very sort of toxic um, enmeshed environment and I thought oh no are these really the two, the two things do they are they am I diverging you know is that really bad anyway I came around to the idea that um, that actually they sort of sat together because you know in, a, in two very very different modes they were in fact talking about similar things um, so I reconciled my myself to that, um, but that became part of the process of like you know the kind of design process and what why we were doing this this show now in 2019 when it's I guess set like 25 years ago, um, like that we had seen I had seen still images of a production that was pre that was done recently in um, Liverpool I think where the you know the two main roles were played by actors who were a lot older than I would have seen them or than they're listed in the script you know it's sort of like very kind of maybe tip of a farmer kind of costumes that I just thought oh that's you know that's not the that's not the approach I want to take at all like you know these are younger men and th that's that's important that they're younger and you know so that I guess informed all of the, the casting decisions and the costuming decisions and um yeah all of that I guess so so yeah, so I guess it, before we go into the rehearsal, that's the process is about sort of um, solidifying the vision for the show, and then once you're in the rehearsal room, I guess I'd say that my job is to equip the actors um, to communicate the play, the play as best they can to the audience. So. Um, and so that means really like usually in the first week spending a lot of time interrogating the script and walking them through kind of all those various discoveries that I've made so that, that can help inform their performance um, and then shaping that, shaping that, shaping that as we go through movement and I guess delivery of the text um, as well as incorporating then all the other production elements you know and, but I do like to keep a focus on so in the rehearsal room like uh, we, you know a focus on movement and voice so that we're not you know that it's not just all about the the mental process you know um because that has to filter out into for the theater it has to filter out into the body and into the voice because those are such massive kind of tools of communication not just speaking the words you know and we have a big auditorium downstairs i don't know have you, have, if you've been in it not yet i'll show you after um it's beautiful but it's it's you know it's a big size it's not a small studio by any stretch so it's um you you have to be a, a sort of a muscular and fit actor in one way to you know to be able to fill the room 
with your, with your voice and with your physicality. So I guess those are the things that I focus on then through rehearsal and then at the very end of the process, uh, managing the, the technical rehearsal alongside the stage manager and making sure you know that every, every element that we need for any given moment through lights, sound, costume, and the actors, that those are all um, merged together in the way that we want and that everybody has a sense then of how that will go so that there's sort of a smooth presentation then for the audience. And so once it gets to having an audience in the room, I typically <coughs> watch the show like this because I find it really challenging in the first few days to, um, to you know, to w watch and assess, you know, work that I've made and then you know, once you kind of take the temperature of the audience after a couple of performances, you get a sense of how they're responding and I'm usually okay then. I can be a little bit more objective at that point, but I have to sort of park. Like, one of the things that I absolutely can't do while I'm in the rehearsal room for four weeks is check on ticket sales, like, or anything like that. I can't worry, I can't be the producer of the show in that moment and I leave that to my colleagues here because that would be distracting. I have to keep very focused on, you know, on what... Um, the show needs so that I can make that the best it can be and then trust that everyone else is doing what they need to do to make sure it's selling tickets. Is uh, uh, an age an issue sometimes because you're so young? You know? Oh yeah I mean I wouldn't say it's an issue but I but certainly like in the beginning you know when people who wouldn't know who I am or what I do like when they come to the theatre and I'd sort of you know pop down and say hello and um, you know people I'll say, oh, I'm Julie, I'm the artistic director, and you can see people go, oh, you know, just there's a little beat of um, surprise sometimes, um, which is interesting, but it, I, I wouldn't say it's an issue, but, it, but it, it's just maybe, I, I'm sometimes not what people expect, so that's okay, though. No. I'm a nice surprise. Um, yeah, and I think certainly in the Irish context over the last five years, um, We've been doing a lot of work to kind of um, tell people who we are and what we do. So I guess some people recognise me a little bit more now, or they know what to expect. <laughs> um, but there's a sort of a slightly jolly younger woman as artistic director in the building. You know. How frequently do you have to travel for your work? Every week, usually. Um, yeah, or at least three out of four weeks, I would say. And that's, that has particularly um, ramped up in the last two years because um, because we were producing this project, asking for it with a co-producer who's based in Dublin and the show was rehearsing there, you know, so there was lots of meetings there. Um, there's two projects that we're working on right now, that one that has a kind of um, a lead producer in Dublin, we're a co-producer on it. Um, so that has necessitated some meetings in Dublin and then uh, one of the shows that we're making in the summer, we'll rehearse in Dublin for financial reasons. Basically, we can't afford to house everybody here for for uh, the four weeks of rehearsal. So, we have a production meeting in Dublin tomorrow on that, and I'm seeing I'm seeing two shows tomorrow, and have a couple of other meetings. So I try and like condense as much as I can into a day's travel where I can. Um, but I will be I'll be up in Dublin next week and then I have a break and then the following week I'm back up again so uh, and typically like I'm, I'm mostly up and down to Dublin but occasionally get you know I'm in Limerick, Waterford, Galway, Belfast other kind of big cities um, and a couple of times a year maybe some international travel but typically like to the UK I'm never really outside of that though someday maybe I'll get to go to like Canada or to Australia that'd be nice and how do you maintain uh, the work-life balance? With some difficulty sometimes, like it's, you know, I'm trying to be, um, I, I didn't manage it at all in the first two years. I, I think I did become a little bit overwhelmed and gave everything to work and kind of all of my time and, um, you know, like it didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't badly harmed. <laughs> But I, you know, I did have to go. Oh, but I'm, I'm really tired. I'm really worn out. And I think, that, you know, for lots of people working in the arts, that's, you know, burnout is a is a danger. Um, but now I try and get to the gym two or three times a week. I have a yoga class every week. Um, try and be. Uh, this is something I find really hard. But I really try to like eat 
properly at meal times and prepare all my food and do things like that. So, and like this is really, I'm only get, I've become much better at this. Like I only started yoga a year into this role, and I definitely like that was the beginning. I think of that, you know, that process of starting to be a little bit better at self care and all of that. And I guess things like, um, you know, Trixie tools on the iPhone, like, you know, um, all of my apps switch off at nine o'clock so I can't well I could I mean I can override it but you know there's a little um, curtain if you like or a veil over it that says after 9 p.m. like no more email for you and I I obey it you know so it's about setting those boundaries I suppose um, yeah I mean it's a work in progress all of the time but I'm much more aware of it now than I was I, th I don't think I realized um, in my first two years how much stress I was under and how that was impacting me physically um, with, with only sort of minor things like nothing serious you know but um, but yeah I really try to now prioritize like getting plenty of sleep and you know all those kinds of things yeah what's the best advice you have ever been given oh my god um, there's a brilliant thing um, that Neil Gaiman said, I mean, he didn't give this to me directly, <laughs> but I remember thinking it was a brilliant piece of advice. Actually, there's two of these. Um, he, that he said in a, uh, I think a commencement address in, at some American university, what, and he's talking about writing, I guess, specifically, but I think it applies to kind of, you know, art making generally and freelance. So he says that like, you can be um, really good at your job and you can be, um, sort of really easy to work with, you know, punctual and on time and deliver on deadline and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can be really nice. But you don't have to be all three. You just need to be two out of the three. So like, even if you're not the absolute best person in your field, you can still go a long distance by being really reliable and being really nice to work with. So I think the thing, when I speak with students, like, I don't think there is any substitute for hard work and being kind you know and that's something that you know would have been instilled in me growing up at home by my parents um, and I think those values are sort of at the core of things I do so I guess that and then the other piece uh, or, or, I guess thing that really resonated with me was um, an American broadcaster and writer called Ira Glass who said you know when you're starting out at the beginning of career um, like most of the things that you'll make, if not everything that you make, will be really shit. So, like you just have to sort of accept that as a reality. But that the, the thing that will get you through is that you have really good taste. Like you spend time sort of acquiring really good taste. So, like if you can just sort of get over the hump of you know, um, making things really badly in the beginning, then you know your taste will kind of see you through to the other side. And I just find that really heartening. You know, it's about sort of failing in a safe space, I guess. Um, yeah, so those are sort of big, big picture things that things that I come back to that are kind of touchstones, I guess, in terms of advice. Yeah. What do you think is the most common misconception about your job? Oh, um, well, so uh, there's been a couple of funny ones. <coughs> so, um, about three years ago, when I I was applying for a mortgage, and I I said to the man on the phone who was a banker, you know mortgage advisor uh, he said oh well, what do you do I said oh I work in um, in the theater and he said oh so you're a nurse and I said no the theater is in like wigs and costumes and thing you know um, and then sometimes I guess people think that I'm and um, so I get uh, emails sometimes from fi maybe film students who think that I'm an art director as opposed to you know because the, the job titles sound a little bit the same so I have to explain that no no, no I'm not an art director um, and the, I guess the other thing is that, you know, when people ask you what you do and you and you say, well, my job title is this, like, I don't know that the job title is helpful to most people in terms of understanding what it is that I do. So I usually tell people, depending on who I'm speaking to, but by and large, I tell people I book the shows. That's what I do. Um, you know, because artistic director, I think outside of the industry is kind of a meaningless term to lots of people. What do you wish you knew when you were just starting out? Um, I think I wish that I knew 
that I had more time. <laughs> so I think when I was younger, like even from kind of teenage years, that I, you know, I was always seemed to be worrying that you know that I was too late or that everything had ha you know things had happened already, and I was sort of behind the curve, and I put myself under a lot of pressure, I guess, to you know <laughs> to try and catch up and. Um, you know, like, so I stopped myself from doing things. Like, for example, I stopped myself from going to London to be, you know, to train more as a performer from a young age because I thought, well, really, you you know, anybody worth their salt will have been there since they were 16 and that's, and you know, and therefore they'll be better. So there's just no point in me trying. So, I, you know, I did lots of putting those kinds of barriers in place. And so I wish I had known um, that people take all sorts of paths to where they go and they start at all different stages of their lives and those things aren't impossible because of time so um yeah i wish i had known that and I, and I think i you know i wish i had known maybe to be a little bit more ambitious you know or that that knowing that might have made me a little bit more ambitious i'm getting there now and i'm growing my ambition as i as i age which is a good thing too but um but yeah i, I think i did a lot of putting obstacles in my own way as a younger person so yeah I wish I had known more that might have counteracted some of those things. And what advice would you give to someone who is interested in becoming a director or an artistic director? Um, I would say see as many shows as you possibly can of all different types. Um, I don't think there's any substitute for, for just getting a sense, you know, for being in the room and getting a sense of how the choices that somebody or a team of people have made on the stage impact, you know, a person who's sitting next to you and the people who are sitting around you in the theatre. I think to understand that exchange is a crucial part of what you do as a director and maybe even broadly, more broadly speaking as an artistic director because it's about, there's something alchemical, you know, uh, about the exchange between what happens in the audience and what's happening on stage. So the more and more you can see of that from like shows for one person up to, you know, shows for thousands. Um, like one of the, one of the best things I remember